think something amazing has happened in the future of Star Trek, right? In the 24th century, uh, human beings don't fight with each other. Everybody seems to have plenty of stuff. And I would argue that whatever that world is, the technology certainly enables it, right? You know, the fact that everybody has matter replicators in their home means that they don't have to go hungry. But there was some other social, political, economic, cultural thing that happens between now and then that allows this society to thrive such that everybody gets access to these things. Um, well, and I, one of the, yeah. I was going to say, if you want to go by the timeline of the Star Trek universe, probably the biggest cause of that was the, was the Third World War, as it were. For example, right. And, yes. And which almost decimated the planet. It was there was the, sort of the light bulb. Went the off light bulb went off, yes. There we go. Yeah. So we hit a crisis and we woke up. Very good. Sure. <laughs> I, would, I would say the cooperation between countries is the next step that we need more cooperation. More cooperation. Because, right. people, because uh, scientists have said that they can make enough solar panels uh, in the African desert to provide power for the entire world, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to do that. Well, right. And, but, and humans, no but humans being well, humans aren't going to do that until some, some until some global crisis, crisis so they're they're where energy. they're forced to all come together. Uh, yeah, I tend to believe something like that as well. Um, but whatever it is, it requires some other social change beyond just the uh, greater technology. Um, so uh, the other thing, you know, the other kind of alternative future um, uh, is the Matrix, right? Oh, yeah, and, more likely that. Future. And you know, the interesting thing about the Matrix is that it's an advanced technology that harvests human energy to feed machine masters while offering us the illusion of a pleasant life. Well, I'm going to suggest that you know we are slowly already approaching that world. It's not necessarily all science fiction because Facebook harvests human attention to feed That's what. Like uh, William Gibson says, you know, he says that uh, the future is already here; it's unevenly distributed. I believe that same is true for you know our technologies. If you really look at the technologies we have, which are really quite amazing, if you think about it, um, you know, they've already proven that some of us can enjoy a really good life, while there can still be billions of people who are not getting access to those same things. And the the one thing that's not there isn't the technology, because we have it, right? There's existence proof as far as the technology being there. What we don't have are the social structures that make sure that everybody has an opportunity to uh, live the life that is um, desirable. I, I love that while offering illusions of peaceful relationships. <laughs> that's, a, that's, 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 that's a different that's panel. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so to kind of tie this back also to my own technical interests, so you know, one of the things I think is really interesting is, uh, is um, just uh, how much I think a lot of digital technology is actually going to change within the near future. So when I was in graduate school, I used to think that you know, some of the problems I, that my field as a whole were trying to um, address would not be solved in my lifetime. And amazingly, these problems are already being solved to an incredible extent, some by Google, some by you know, university researchers, and so on. Um, this is a, I, I don't know if you've seen this, but this mm -hmm. is a, one of the images that uh, the group at Google that does image um, processing has released. And basically what they've done is they've taken their, what is effectively a neural network that takes in an image and outputs um, you know, sequences of words about what the image is about. Right? And in many ways, that is the intelligence problem for, for images, which is can you get a machine to understand what the content of an image is. And li literally until five, you know, even five years ago, people could not do this in any reliable way. Um, it's a simple task for human beings, very difficult for computers. Uh, today, there are inklings that this is actually going to be solved within a few within a few years. Uh, people can, uh, you know, people, uh, researchers can already do this quite well. And what's interesting about this is you can get a sense for how close these computers are getting to something that is like human intelligence because this is basically the same neural network kind of run in reverse, starting with one image and then having the having the network hallucinate all kinds of different things. So. You know, it's, it's wacky and weird and eerie because it's so human in the way that it's kind of created these wacky combinations of buildings and animals and so on. Yeah. So, so is this supposedly what the computer is seeing? What, what no, are we so, looking at here? So, yeah, so again, I, it's, it, you know, the best way to think about it is that in a, in a sense it's kind of the computer dreaming, right, given what it now knows, right? So what they do is they start with one image, and I think in this case it was a, probably an image of uh, buildings, and they said, okay, I want you to start hallucinating dog-like things. And so, 
you know, they, they run us over time. Yeah, peacocks and other animals. And it starts hallucinating these animals in, you know, the little parts of the image where basically it, it accentuates things that look like animals. Mm -hmm. right. right? And, you know, what's eerie about it is how dreamlike it looks, right? It really looks like things that you would see out in some, you know, wacky science fiction uh, movie. Um, and, uh, you know, to me this is amazing. It's something, from a technological standpoint, it is amazing. I mean, it basically suggests that we are getting very close to duplicating capacities that we thought were unique to human beings. No, um, we can't even. And, you know, the challenge with these things is that, uh, you know, I think of this kind of technology, especially as it matures, as being like the atomic bomb of the digital world, right? It makes, the, it makes all the things that we already know about, like, you know, plastic toy guns in comparison. And, you know, unlike atomic weapons, which are currently in the hands of, you know, reasonably responsible governments, this is going to be in the hands of a for-profit company that sees a shareholder value as its primary moral imperative. Right, and so, so if you believe that technology amplifies That's underlying human forces, yeah, That's it's a potentially a nightmare. And the only way that we can address these things is to fix the human side of these things. We need to implement policies that make sure that there are reins on, you know, corporate power. That make sure that, you know, that the, uh, inequality doesn't run too crazy. Um, that make sure that, you know, that uh, we don't end up concentrating too much power in the hands of a very small number of people. Too late. Well, <laughs> it could be. We have a technophobic <laughs> Congress. I'm not sure how we're going to get around that. Uh, right. They don't even understand science. No, it's true. It's true. What's going on? Wait, did they, they have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Creationism and don't put, you know, Darwinism is a get it out of the schools and don't put it in the textbooks. <laughs> uh, so just to summarize, technology amplifies underlying human forces. It doesn't, in and of itself, fix dysfunctional institutions, democratize politics, or shrink inequality. And then, you know, if you believe this, the kind of interesting irony is that especially in a world with, we, where we have a lot of technology already, the most important thing is to really address the social issues. And if okay, you get so those what's right, your next step then? If you get those right, the technology kind of magically does the right thing for you as well. Uh, my next, so you know, I'm a computer scientist, but um, I'm increasingly doing work which is less about the technology and more about helping people you know, develop the capacity to uh, reach their own aspirations. So I have you know, a couple projects in Detroit where we're trying to help people like you know, use technology in some way, but really it's about helping them become more entrepreneurial on their own and things like that. So. Um, one thing. aspect of the technology that, that seems important um, that I don't think you touched on too much, although I guess it kind of ties in maybe with that Edward Clinton quote, is transparency. Sure. You know, is, is, you know, like the economic crisis happened in large part because people were given access to huge sums of money in right. dark rooms, yes. and it's like, okay, do whatever you want with right. it. So, to what degree, could the technology have safeguards built into it, which obviously have to be motivated by these human desires to have right. transparency? So I would say, you know, uh, that's a good point. So technology can enable transparency in the sense that it can be the channel by which transparency happens. But technology by itself is never the political force behind causing transparency, right? So no government is going to make its, you know, um, sensitive data transparent without itself deciding that that's what's important, right? Or unless there are social activists who insist that they pull it out of the government. Um, and this is true even in very open societies like the United States. I mean, you know, the whole thing with WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden was interesting because it kind of showed that as much as we talk about transparent information and free access to information, you know, there are things that the government does not want to be made public. Um, and, and it's ultimately up to the governments to make that uh, uh, public. Uh, same with banks, right? So if you're a private interest, you know, you're not, you're gonna, you're, you're not gonna let go of private data, you know, uh, unless you absolutely, unless it's literally like, you know, wrung out of your hands, out of your grip. Yeah. And that requires laws and it requires enforcement well, by social what's action. What's going to happen with the, the Flint water crisis? Right, 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 exactly. The very, the, the very first set of emails released by Snyder, the very first oh, one oh, was completely blacked out. It was yeah. completely, exactly, that's right. So, um, you know, so, you know, once somebody decides to make something transparent, then the technology is a great way to get it out there. But that decision still remains a political one at heart, that the technology itself doesn't change. Yeah. The other side. Sure. <laughs> Number of people living in extreme poverty around the world is likely to fall under 10% in 2015, according to the World down. Bank. It is. It's been yeah. for a while. Um, and that is a quarter century long sustained reduction in poverty. Um, they are talking about possibly getting to very close to zero by 2030. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
I think technology is a factor in that. I agree. I completely agree. So again, I you know, and if you watch this carefully, you'll see that nowhere does it say that technology is bad or that technology is right. uh, impactless, or even that technology doesn't all the whole make life better for everybody. Um, and it, that's, this is on purpose, right? So. What I'm trying to suggest is that there are some human forces that are in right. so many of us that you add technology and it does improve the overall situation a little bit. But one of the things that we are not very good at as, a, you know, as human civilization is, for example, making sure that everybody benefits equally. And so what right. you see is you know, when you introduce technology, the benefits go you know, uh, differentially to different people. Those who have benefits want to ensure that they, they and their kin continue to benefit. Exactly. And so there's That's a rich get richer phenomenon that is very difficult to go away. And, and one of the challenges I think you know, nowadays that we're hitting as, with respect mm -hmm. to this is that you know, we're on a finite planet, the population is growing, and consumption is growing, which means that there is going to be a time when what we think of as limitless resources that everybody can benefit from become you know, there's a cap on it, at which becomes right. it becomes a zero-sum game, and so those with power and wealth end up taking more. And we're seeing some of this already. So, you know, um, you know, increasingly people are aware that the food supply is going to, you know, is going to not do, do, not decrease, but dwindle in proportion to the number of human mouths we need to feed. And so there is a mad rush to acquire land in Africa. And so very rich, powerful interests outside of Africa have now bought, you know, land in Africa about the size of the country of France, apparently, geographic area of France. You know, for pennies in Africa, displacing lots and lots of farmers, but, you know, so that they have a future, you know, they're worried about their own future uh, food supply. Um, the so these kinds of things are going to happen more and more. One of the things that struck me, your early discussion of what you were doing in India, is that something that is imposed by people from the outside is rarely going to be successful, as Mark Zuckerberg is wearing right now in sure. India. Uh, but that when you work with people, and you know, in Africa, there are some very good things happening as a combination of, you know, cell phones and solar technology and stuff like that. That uh, is, in fact, helping a lot of Africans to. I, move I completely up agree. To a Actually, you know, I didn't go into this too much because I feel like it's secondary to um, you know the main thrust of my talk. But you know, many of these projects that we did in India were done not only in collaboration with you know, various organizations in India that worked there, but actually with them in the league, right? Where we, all we were doing was helping them build the technology that they thought that they wanted. And so in many cases, it was run in a way that's, you know, that's considered human-centered, user-centered, um, and all of that. And again, in you know, research pilots, these projects worked great within the limited scope because often we were working with good institutions. But as soon as you take the same technology to another context, you know, where the institutions are not as good, uh, the technology itself doesn't solve those problems. Um, I think you're also right that, you know, a lot, there's a lot of change happening in Africa in terms of economic growth. I think, um, you know, what's going to happen with that overall is yet to be seen. But one of the things that I, I'm afraid of is that, you know, things are happening very quickly, but inequality is also expanding at a, uh, at a enormous rate. Um, you have a question? Oh, you're talking about um, what technology, and we don't need to wait to the 24th century to eliminate some kinds of poverty. Utah eliminated homelessness by giving the homeless homes. And they saved money, they eliminated homelessness, like there's been nothing but net improvements in quality of life. Why has this been adopted over the entire U.S.? Well, we can't give the poor people things. Oh, uh, if they really want to give the poor, bootstraps, you know. Well, no, no, but it, if we give them homes, then why would anybody else work? <laughs> they just right. don't it's work and they'll give you a home. Bullshit. Bullshit. And until you solve the puritanical bullshit, Yes. Like, we could probably could feed everyone on the planet. Yes, we can. argue about the whole, like, we can feed. Generally, we can feed. It's generally accepted that there's enough food on the planet. Distribution issues. Poor people deserve to be poor. If they didn't want to be poor, they wouldn't be poor. Is the <laughs> they work harder. Certainly, no, you're, logic that runs by the you're absolutely right. And these are, you know, these are, again, political issues, right? That right. we have to settle as a society. And until they get settled, it won't matter that there is, in fact, plenty of food, uh, that there's plenty of technology to go around. Thank you. Seems um, to be called bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. In conclusion, early 2016. There's an earlier uh, graph uh, uh, relating to the United States, yes. and matter of fact, the, obviously the definition of poverty in the United States is much different than what the world tells yes, that's true. Uses. Uh, it's <coughs> my understanding, I believe this is correct, is that from the 40s, 50s on to uh, the 70s, 
generally speaking, if you were in good health and willing to work in an uncomfortable location like a factory, you could do you would do quite well. Pretty well for yourself, right. maybe even middle class, yes. but as things became more technological, for lack of a better term, Can't do it now. you had so many people who, for one reason or another, didn't have right. extra sure. education competing for fewer and fewer jobs. Right, that's um, right. Now, uh, Larry Summers, uh, a year or two ago, mentioned that he thought there was a possibility that the economy had gone into a phase because, and I believe what he was getting at, in large part because of technology, whereas before uh, expanding economic um, growth or just continuance would provide more and more jobs for right. you know pretty much everybody as long as you had you know let's say a junior high, I mean a, a, a junior college education. And he thought that perhaps there had been a change now, and that a very pernicious change, and that that was no longer the case. I mean, I so think I there's what your thoughts were. I think there's some truth to that. I mean, so you know, I've looked at a lot of different um, disciplines and how they interpret this, you know, this fact. And one of the weird things is a lot of things seem to have all happened around 1970, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of things like. You know, laws were passed that suddenly decided that, for example, you know, unions would not be as strong. You know, there was forces of globalization. Um, there were things like, you know, support for federal support for secondary schools was not as strong. Um, you know, all th all these kind of things that seem like they're completely disconnected, and they all seem to happen around the you know early 1970s. And then since then, it does seem like we are heading in a very different direction from before that time. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, you know people who study like you know, uh, the relationship between corporations and government, you know, they find that again, in this period between 1940s and 1970s, there was this shared sense of mission among CEOs and people in Congress that they were trying, you know, of course, it's not that the CEOs were completely doing this for um, selfless purposes, but they were trying to build a country that was where the economy was strong. And you know, these days, you don't hear that, you know, people say, you know, the corporate responsibility is for shareholder value. It's a worldwide, well, it's, it's a, a world market now. It's a world it's market. It's a world market. <laughs> That's right. Too, right? And, and, and I think that all of these things a world um, workplace. are there without the technology, but with the technology, they kind of get amplified, right? They get, can, they uh, get uh, expanded because now all of a sudden corporations' reach can be much larger mm -hmm. than used to be. If I can raise a, a question about uh, global warming. Sure. Uh, if I use your, your thesis here, my conclusion would be that uh, technology is not going to take us out of global warming. It's going to have to be under changing the underlying human forces to, to yes, recognize yes. it. And it's going to be a human effort, not a technology effort. Right. Well, so, you know, again, I, I don't want to discount the role of technology. I mean, even amplification in any form is a, still a powerful thing, yes. right? Um, and I do think that you know, for things like climate change, it is going to require significant technology to get us out of it. But, but it's the humans that drive the technology. That's right. Technology. But the technology in and of itself isn't going to do it. So it's well, not going to be because some you know number of small companies has figured out some magic solution that climate change is going to be averted. Uh, it's going to be because at some government level or at an individual level. And then all it's going to be just like Mother Earth. Because, you know, we hit the beginning of winter, December 21st. And you know your, your day starts getting longer, but we've got another three months before we're right. There's a lag time in terms of yes. So it's like we're going to address it, but it's we're going to have to have the patience to wait because that's gonna, right. It's got to take time. So um, like, and you know the challenging thing about these things is you know it's easy to kind of demonize certain entities, but you know we all are kind of complicit in it, right? Like you know I know that you know burning fossil fuels is not helping with climate change, and yet you know I, I drive happily out. drive every day, right? Yeah. And it's not yeah, it's not. It's not easy to get out of that system, and well, so we're kind of trapped because because there's no choices. We don't have a public transportation. Right. System I mean, it takes an incredible change of will. That's reliable and quick, yeah. and will get us where we need to go. That's right. We need transporters. Um, but you can buy more fuel economy cars. And you can do and you can things. stay within the But it costs limit. cheaper to buy a non-fuel efficient car. It costs a significant amount more to get a not. A, um, I disagree. My, my Honda still gets 35 miles to the gallon at 16 years old, and it was a $13,000 car. Right. I mean, I agree with all these things. I think, you know, what, the other thing that um, the technology kind of distracts us from is that, you know, we still need to be just as organized and uh, politically active 
uh, now as ever, and you know, just because we can you know, retweet things and click on Facebook doesn't mean that you know, that's enough, right? Like we still have to organize, we still have to work towards policy changes that we believe in. Yeah. So, uh, one of the, uh, it's really kind of very interesting here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a graph, you know, like the idea of the poverty rate. Like that job spot. Okay, here I'm, uh, I think that's such a small measure. Like sure. Quality, quality of life, I think, would be more of a, you know, good poverty, it's, it's like a microscope looking at itself, essentially. You, know, you look at through the financial kind of the, the money paradigm on quality on exi and your life. Sure. You know, it's such a one factor, it's like the management and the sharing of financial resources. No, you're right. I mean, sharing on that, which, in a sense, in like the familial sense, you know, I'm, um, I don't make a lot of money right now, but you know, I made some, I've been very blessed. Made some conscious decisions, like with, live with my family. Technically, I'm in the poverty area, but my quality of life is it's pretty good. No, I agree. So, you know, this is really just a symbolic way of expressing something, which is to say that there are people in this country. I mean, this is the richest country in the world, and yet there are people in this country who are not doing economically well and who are miserable because of it. There right? are three million people who will say a little two dollars a day. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, especially in this area, we don't have to go very far to find families who are you know, in this situation. Um, and the people in Flint. Right, or people in Flint, right. And, all of, and the amazing thing about this, you know, about this situation is that so many of these people have access to the internet. They have mobile phones. And, but that access isn't enough. Right? It's not enough to treat your life. Not by itself. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Like Thank you. I just would like to identify four technologies that I think are absolutely essential for getting rid of poverty. Okay. Um, birth control, uh, the elimination of childhood diseases mm -hmm. vaccinations, uh, instantaneous communications, and uh, transportation, faster transportation right. than walking. Um, I don't deny that. So again, I'm not saying that the technology is not important or critical. It's just that it is not going to be the one thing that changes the face of poverty and inequality. It's, it's a, it might be an important part and we might need it. And again, you know, some of us have a very good life, which suggests that we have that, the technology exists. The, the harder question is, how do we ensure that everybody has equal, you know, ability to benefit from it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many people have seen the uh, YouTube uh, uh, sequence of comparing uh, the poor to horses? I have not. Nobody's seen that, it's amazing, okay. Uh, basically, it's a political statement that uh, says, sort of what he was saying, well, the poor should be poor, they should uh, die out. The, cha the difference is in the fabulous 50s, as they were sometimes called, or the roaring 20s, you had instead the literature at the time talked about, uh, as uh, business improved, every one of the employees should improve. Right. Actually, you, actually right. in most cases, not the manager. The uh, workers who produced more. Right. Yes. And that's, that's we have, yeah, we have to recover culture, that culture. Support your unions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.